You're listening to iCannabisRadio.com. Hello, hello, hello. Happy Monday. It is the 17th of December, 2012. I'm Georgia, and you're listening to iCannabis Radio. Um, we have a great show tonight, um, which is, you know, a dumb thing to say. I think I've said that before. I don't know why. We have a shitty show tonight. You should stop listening. I mean, who says that? No one ever. Um I'm in the studio with my favorite producer in history, Chris. What's happening? Hi. <laughs> and Sam's in the studio as well. Hi, Sam. Hi, Georgia. And we are joined by a new member of the iCannabis Radio family who I don't think is going to be on camera. Um, Diesel's little brother, Hayes, is here, but they just ran out to pee in the hallway. Diesel. And they, they'll be back. <laughs> they'll be back. Sorry. Um, they're not really peeing in the hallway. So tonight is um, our cannabis history lesson with Greg Dower, which is always fun and interesting. Tonight we're going to be talking about the legendary Ken Gorman. And for those of you who uh, know Ken, knew Ken Gorman, uh, this will be a wonderful stroll, stroll down memory lane. For those of you that are not familiar, um, he was a, a magical, interesting um, person in in the world he was he was a lot like uh um i don't know the pied piper of the cannabis movements um so i'm uh i'm looking at uh at my shirt and that is a big fat santa i'm feeling in the christmas spirit um the holiday spirits um because it was uh this past friday the 14th of december when a um, gunman walked into an elementary school in Newtown, Connecticut, and gunned down uh, first graders and school personnel, and then um, probably thankfully um, killed himself. And so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about about that later on, but but I started off by saying I'm sort of in the holiday spirit because when things like that happen, we can make a couple of choices and our choices revolve around um, spending time grieving or thinking about the bad things that happen or we can spend time appreciating what we have and and what we, what we can do and what we can change. We certainly can't change what happened. We have some control over how we react to it. To it. We have some control over... Um, how we present ourselves and we have some control over what happens in the future. And so so I I have made a concerted effort to A to not listen to every gory detail of this event and um and definitely uh, hold my kid tight. This morning I I dropped him off at school and I know there were lots of people who were saying that they were nervous about sending their kids to school today. Um that wasn't my experience. I wasn't nervous dropping my son off. I really didn't think that something tragic was going to happen. He he knows. I, we, we did tell him just briefly um, what happened, but we didn't go into detail. We asked some questions. We asked, asked if he had questions. We asked him some if he had some thoughts or comments or what have you, and he didn't, so we just sort of left it alone. But when I went to the school... There was a police officer, two police officers parked in a police car across from the main entrance of the school. And and I, I guess that's supposed to make us feel more comfortable or safer or that the police are there in case something should happen. And, and in all reality, that's not how it affected me. It affected me um, sort of the opposite. Not that I felt more nervous, but that I felt... I felt sadder. I felt I felt um, it just kind of disappointed that we're in the in the stage where where a K through fifth grade has to be patrolled by police officers, and 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 my son's school already has uh, some pretty good uh, security measures, just like Sandy Hook had. Um, the school locks all of its doors. During school hours, you can only enter into one door and you're buzzed in and it's a door that the the window uh, out front of the or next to the door is is the office and so the office can look out and and buzz you in 
uh, and then you're to go to the office and get a visitor badge and wear your visitor badge around the school, which is the one thing that really doesn't happen. Every time I get buzzed into school, I know everybody, it's a small school, and so I don't bother to go and get a sign in and get a visitor badge, which I think is something that they're probably going to keep uh, better watch over and make sure that that kid that that people who are visiting the school are are um, signing in at the office and and we know who's in and who's not. But but anyway, I just I felt like I felt like th- that police officer sitting across the street from my son's school did nothing other than than prove to me that we're in a time where things are so radically different than I want them to be. And and um, my son last night told me about, uh, I remember, and I, I grew up in South Florida, so we had hurricane drills, which is so dumb because you know what, you know a hurricane is coming, so there's not you're not going to be in school. If there's a hurricane coming, they're canceling school. So I don't know why we did hurricane drills, but we did tornado drills and hurricane drills and f- fire drills and, and all those kinds of things. Well, my son told me last night about the lockdown drills that they do, and and if if the school go, does a lockdown drill, they they send the kids, they have them turn out the lights and close the blinds in the school, and then hide in a certain area so that if someone is looking in the door or the windows, they can't see the children. Um, and I asked him; he's in second grade, and I asked him why, you know, what what what's the reason that you do these drills? And he said, well, if there's a if there's a robber in the building, or if there's someone on the property who shouldn't be, or if someone does something nearby the school that that shouldn't happen, then we do these drill, or then then we would do these drills. And and he was pretty nonchalant about it because, of course, that's that's how he's grown up. I mean, he um, he wasn't born when when the Columbine shootings happened. I mean, this is sort of a uh, normal life for him. But but I just thought, gosh, you know. Um, a lockdown drill is something that my kid is is accustomed to and is used to and and he knows what it means to go on lockdown and whew, it was it was um a hard thing to to hear uh but yet but yet it's the it's the reality it's the reality so having said all of that um we are going to jump into talking about cannabis because you know this is i cannabis radio uh and and we'll talk a little bit more about sandy hook later on but right now we're gonna we're gonna call our first guest and our first guest is is matt abel out of detroit michigan Matt is uh, an attorney. You guys have listened to the show before. You know he's been on several times before. And uh, hey, hey, Matt, it's Georgia. You're live on the air. Hello, Georgia. How are you, my friend? Uh, it's great to be back on iCannabis Radio. This is. It's great. It's great to have you on iCannabis Radio. I was just thinking, I, I it's been it's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah, several months, I think. So I was just and, uh, I was just introducing you a little bit. Um, so tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do. Well, I'm Abel, and um, by my own account, the leading marijuana lawyer in Michigan. Har, har, har. My account and, too. Um, <laughs> we formed a law firm, Cannabis Council, about uh, well four twenty of ten, and have been kicking it ever since. There are four lawyers here and four support staff people. And um, we are um, fighting the cannabis war in Michigan at every turn. Um, all four of us only handle marijuana cases and clients. We represent dispensaries and people charged with felonies and misdemeanors and um, all form of business entities. Um, in addition, I am the director of Michigan Normal and um, am hard at work trying to uh, change the law that way as well. So there's plenty going on in my life. Um, The Michigan legislature in their lame duck session last week, um, about 4.20 in the morning, those bastards passed um, (laughs) six bills uh, that amended the medical marijuana law. Um, Well, at least the session went that late. So they jammed through, I don't know, 50 or so pieces of legislation in one night and um, really uh, didn't do us any favors. So um, it's not as bad as it could have been. The very worst provision was they wanted access to the names in the registry just to to uh, run them by name, to search by name. And uh, they did not get that. 
um, to search by name or address. So the registry is still pretty well protected here. So what did happen? Well, let's see. Um, there were six bills. One of them <clears throat> just put into the sentencing guidelines the crime of selling to someone in violation of the restrictions. Um, and the, the courts right now are determining what are the restrictions, who you can sell to, who not. And we expect that case to come down maybe even later this week um, about whether patient-to-patient -patient sales are legal. But then they passed a bill saying that um, a company didn't have to pay workers' comp benefits for marijuana. Um, so if someone gets that, injured... You know, that, that marijuana couldn't, that a patient, a person who's using it could not be compensated through their workers' comp benefits for it. Likewise, for another bill regarding no-fault auto insurance, wow. um, where a, an auto insurer may not be required to compensate someone for um, medical marijuana. Um, <clears throat> the worst bill, in my opinion, is a new misdemeanor is created where you're required to transport medical marijuana in the trunk of your vehicle, or if you don't have a trunk in a locked case that's inaccessible. And wow. So, um, yeah, there's a new crime now, a uh, misdemeanor for carrying marijuana in your car. It'll take effect April 1st here in Michigan. I don't know if the governor signed it yet, but I'm pretty sure he will. And, um, you know, that's ugly. And then there's um, a bill that really codifies some stuff about the physician-patient relationship um, and the enclosed lock facility definitions. And then the good news is the car will be good for two years instead of one. They'll include photographs um, when we submit, like, passport photos. Um, oh, there's wow. There's going to be the registry could be sent out to a private contractor if they're behind, but it seems they're finally caught up here. And um, let's see. Oh, out-of-state patients um, will no longer qualify. You need a Michigan address. And it wasn't clear. I mean, there were out-of-state people getting uh, cards in Michigan. It wasn't clear from the law, but now they're uh, effective April 1st. You need to have a Michigan address either a P.O. box or a, uh, well, I think you need to submit a Michigan ID, either a driver's license or a state ID card in order to be eligible. So that's a darn shame. So get one while you can, folks. <laughs> can I you? So, of course, in Colorado there, nobody needs any stinking cards, right? Well, we don't pretty, need no badges. That's right. Although although it's a little, it's a little difficult because, because there aren't any places to buy unless you're patient. So unless you're, it's just, there's, there, we're, we're in a little bit of a gray area out here for, for a while. That. Well, can't you grow your own six plants? You can, you can. <laughs> you have to get seeds from someone who didn't get them from a dispensary, which causes some problems. And you got to get your, your clones from someplace that didn't get them from a dispensary. So it's, you know, it's a little, it's a little bit tricky. It's a little bit tricky. It, it certainly is. It's going to be an interesting year. So, so why, for sure. why this whole thing about about putting um, putting your medical marijuana in in a trunk or a locked box? I mean, is that a, instead of doing a driving under the influence legislation? Well, no, we already have a per se well a, a zero tolerance driving under the influence law. The Supreme Court is deciding whether to take a review of that. But um, right now, if you have one nanogram of active THC in your blood, that would be enough for uh, the court to, for a jury to find you guilty. Although that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Who thought of that? Succeeded in in uh, getting the lab technician um, not qualified, or or their method under Daubert, which is the standard for scientific proof. Uh, the judge specifically said it's not that the lab isn't up to standard, it's just that the, they were unable to respond to the defense's questions about blah, blah, blah. Oh, my so, gosh. Um, yeah. Oh, my gosh. One nanogram? What? Well, anything, really, any measurable amount. Now, there's, I mean, the argument on the, on the other side of that is that there's no reliability until you get to a certain level, um, whether it's, you know, five or... 10 or 50, and in, in blood, I'm sorry, in urine, it's 50 nanograms, that anything under that is not so reliable, um, but I don't know what the cutoff is in blood, but um, 
we're still, you know, arguing the science of that, or actually just beginning to argue the science of it. But we do have several driving under the influence cases, and in fact, in one of our cases today, the judge just ordered the lab to produce all the information that we need to fight it the way it's been done. So oh, we're good. following in the in the trail that's been burned for us, literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then, let's see, last Friday, finally, four years later, the state um, finally convened the panel to consider new conditions, and good. they considered two petitions for um, post-traumatic stress and one for Parkinson's disease. They recommended that Parkinson's go to the uh, public hearing with a approval recommendation, and they recommended that the uh, PTSD go to the public hearing with a denial recommendation. Either way, they're mandated to have the hearing. We actually sued them f for their failure to convene this panel, and there are a hundred. There are over a hundred other petitions that were filed, but because they just concocted their own form a couple of months ago and sent it out to people, um, if people didn't respond, they're not considering their earlier documents as petitions, even though they didn't set up any rulemaking or have any authority to create this form and then force people to use it. Meanwhile, in their talk about the other 100, when they mailed the questionnaires to everybody, they said, well, some had moved, some came back where the people had died. And I said, yeah, that's our point. People died waiting for you guys to consider that's their right. conditions. That's you right. Know? That's outrageous. What is, what is your feeling about why PTSD is such a difficult sell? Um, I mean, it's to me, it seems like a slam dunk. Um, it, well, there were some concerns. I agree, it seems like a slam dunk. And there was, there was a concern expressed by a uh, panelist who's a doctor with the VA, that the Veterans Administration, mm -hmm. that if um, veterans are going to self-medicate, with, with that a lot of veterans who have post-traumatic stress need counseling. And that the fear is that if they only, that they will only self-medicate with marijuana and never get the counseling, the counseling that really would help them. I mean, the marijuana may dull the pain, but it could be that the counseling will help them work through it. And I think that's a, a valid point. Um, I don't think that it's such that you know, PTSD shouldn't be approved. I think PTSD should be approved and that we should get veterans the counseling that they need. Well, anyway. and, and, <laughs> you know, as a, I mean, I, I throw in my, my licensed clinical social work hat every once in a while, and this is one of those circumstances. Ah. I mean, let's, um, you know, we, we are, we're really happy to have, to have psychiatrists um, prescribe a whole lot of medications without co-occurring therapy, um, and that doesn't seem to be a problem. Oftentimes, um, you know, it's really helpful to get people on medication first, get them stabilized before they're able to handle any kind of, of, of talk treatment. And, and this isn't different. This isn't, you know, people will, will make the determination as they're starting to feel better, whether or not they want to take the next step and go into talk therapy. And, and it's really, really hard when you're in the throes of, um, of your your mental anguish to to say, well, you know what, we're going to dangle your medication out in front of you, which which you know will help you, but only if you're willing to do this other thing. I mean, I think as a as a clinician, I think that's irresponsible. Right, and point well taken. And I think the board probably needs to hear that. Well, uh, that's the type of thing they need to hear at the public hearing they scheduled now for January twenty fifth. So um, there will be the public hearing. They will then, um, after that public hearing, have another meeting where they, were, where they will reconsider their recommendations. And then if they recommend approval, it goes to the director of the department. And um, if that person, and then that person has complete discretion to approve it or deny it. Sounds a lot like the rescheduling process to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> With yeah. the complete discretion part. We go through all this stuff, and then you can still turn it down. Well, my fingers are crossed both for yeah. PTSD and Parkinson's. Um, you know, that is that's a that is a, a good step forward to be able to add some, some um, allowable conditions. I think that that's wonderful. Absolutely. 
And we know we did a Freedom of Information Act request, and we're compiling the list of the other conditions, but there were several for anxiety and depression and other um, emotional issues that certainly at least should be considered. Yeah, absolutely. And anxiety is a qualifying condition in California. So. See? I'm always worried I'm going to get busted. It makes me really angry. <laughs> All right, Mr. Abel. Well, as usual, thank you so much. And I'm and I'm sorry with that I uh, I had you on short notice today, but I appreciate the fact that you could be on this evening. Happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas. Thank you. Happy holidays to you and the listeners, everybody, and peace out. Peace out. <laughs> You're listening to iCannabis Radio. That was our dear friend Matt Abel out of uh, Detroit, Michigan. And he is a pretty amazing attorney. If you're in Detroit or if you've got some questions, please don't hesitate to look him up. We are going to, to take a break. We are brought to you by Couple Collimore and Company. They are your commercial general liability and property insurers to dispensaries and growers. They provide commercial general liability, up to a million dollars protection if you're sued because someone claims to have been injured on your premises or because someone got sick from something you gave them. They'll also provide you property insurance, which includes everything in your building, including your fixtures, equipment, supplies, decorating, improvements, betterments, all those kinds of things. They also provide you with loss of business income, which can be included under the property policy. If you are interested in getting crop insurance or any of those other insurances, please don't hesitate to call Cuffle Collimore and Company, toll free 877-335-1234 or email rtc at iwic.net. We are also brought to you tonight, ha ha ha, doing a little craziness for you, Chris, by Medical Marijuana of the Rockies, <laughs> your mountain source for meds. It's ski season. When you're driving up to the mountains, make sure that you head through Frisco off of exit 203 off of I-70, right behind the Big O tires. Medical Marijuana of the Rockies has the largest um, clone selection in that area you can check out their website mmrockies.com for their ever-changing clone and flower selection make sure you tell aaron and jerry that you heard about them on iCannabis radio we will be right back are you a medical marijuana patient or interested in finding out how to become one contact mile high wellness where your care is our concern conveniently located on hamden and tamarack in the whole foods parking lot behind proof of the pudding mile high wellness offers a wide variety of edibles hashes and some of colorado's top strains mile high wellness where your care is our concern 3525 south tamarack suite 110 on the corner of hamden and tamarack 720-382-8516 mile high wellness where your care is our concern I'm Gary Johnson, and you're listening to iCannabis Radio, and I want to say, talk it up, Colorado. Hi, welcome to iCannabis Radio. I'm Georgia, and we were just talking to Matt Abel. Thank you very much. And now we have Greg Dower in the studio for our monthly cannabis history lesson. Hi, Greg. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays to you. So, uh... We're going to talk a little bit about Ken Gorman, I understand. That's right, yes. Next (laughs) next question. (laughs) Next statement. (laughs) And it looks like we're going to start with a song, is that right? Yes, we are. It's a Christmas song. Uh, Ken Gorman put out a a Ken Gorman Christmas CD before he died, and this they were all marijuana-themed songs. Um, Ken Gorman was uh, an activist in... uh, Colorado marijuana history. He led uh, smoke-ins at the Capitol. Uh, he went to jail for selling marijuana. He was a big marijuana salesman, and uh, he became a uh, medical marijuana salesman as well. Uh, before he died, uh, uh, from what was said to be an attempt at robbery, he was shot to death. You know, one of the things I think is interesting about Ken, I mean, I, I described him as the Pied Piper of the cannabis movement. Yes, that you can very well be said. He um, he started the um, the smokings at the Capitol, as you said, and he... Pretty much. I mean, someone first proposed it, and then he kind of showed up uh, and took over from there. He um, took the reins. Ken uh, was known for always having... Um, sort of helping people out and having them come to his house and so forth and um, and uh, he was 
from what I understand, and, and he never told me this directly, but he he was growing in his house, and so he had people. It was it it was known that he had marijuana in his house, and. I'm sure that's probably the case. I'm probably one of three people in Denver who never bought marijuana from Ken Gorman. So I never um, bought marijuana from Ken Gorman. <laughs> 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 I want to be clear about but, that. Uh, but lots of people did, and uh, he influenced uh, a whole host of uh, mm, the um, younger ca- cannabis activists in their 20s and early 30s, because a lot of them were youngsters when they went to his rallies at the Capitol. He really was kind of a Pied Piper. He kind of uh, yet led a, a youth revolution. That's right. A uh, children's crusade almost. Um, one friend said that he always believed that uh, getting to people uh, and getting them to change the law would be through the kids getting to their parents. So Interesting. Um, you know, for, for better or worse, that's what happened. And here we are today. Uh, Ken's not uh, here to enjoy legalization. He, wa- he probably would have been one of those five people standing outside the Capitol smoking weed on the day it became legal in Colorado. Last Monday. Um, so um, that's what made me think of him. And, and this uh, Christmas CD, did, did we get to see the cover of that too? Ken Gorman Christmas? Yeah. yeah. When did he when did he do the Christmas CD? That's hilarious. You know, I'm not real sure. Okay. It was probably just a few years before he uh, died. Uh, I'm I'm going to suspect two to five years, but I don't have the full details on that. I want to give a hat tip to Jason Lauv, who um, went ahead and gave me that CD because I he, he knows I knew about. Uh, Ken and his history. I used to, uh, I wrote about him for High Times, about his smokings and his troubles with the law. Um, I attended uh, the rallies of the Capitol, photographed a lot. We'll see in a little bit some photographs that I, I took of as well of uh, Ken at the Capitol. Um, it's a <coughs> yeah, this is a this is a great album well, what cover. Am I, That's what hilarious. You, oh, the you cover. seen this? The album the cover. cover. Yeah, it looks awesome. It says, warning, this CD contains naughty language. <laughs> yeah. And I think that song we heard was, I'm Dreaming of uh, Legal Marijuana or Legal Weed, sung to the tune of I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas. Yeah, I think, I think one of the things that we all thought about when, when um, the Holder Men- Memo came out, when 64 passed, is, is how... Uh, it would have been great for Ken to have witnessed all of that. Oh, that's that's for sure. Um, well, some people say he was sickly. I'm not sure exactly what the case was. Mm. But, uh, you know, it's... Um, um, well, let me bring up a weird story. A friend told me um, that uh, Ken had a favorite book. It was called Illusions. Uh, like the Adventures, I think, of a Reluctant Messiah, the covers there. Richard Bach book. He, he, he wrote Jonathan Livington, yes, Steve yes, Siegel. And he, um, he kind of saw himself as kind of a Messiah-like character um, in certain regards. I think people who um, observed him would, would agree with that. But he, also, he said to this friend of mine that he imagined himself uh, – being killed by an insider, somebody that he knew. Really? That he was the Messiah and this uh, Judas character would kill him. And there was an article in Westward a few years ago, and it doesn't exactly um, say that, but uh, his own daughter says that uh, um, Ken always said that he was going to go out uh, probably in a violent way and from doing what he was doing. And and I remember the rumors after he was murdered mm-hmm. um, that that it was someone he knew. Then it wasn't, you know, that was initially was that was that it was someone he knew who knew what was in his house and came in and and then and then I don't really know what happened after that. Well, they investigated it. Uh, I guess in this Westward article, uh, the police told. Uh, Ken's daughter, that they had a suspect who was already in prison, but they, I, I guess they couldn't bring a case. Um, the, the thing, though, um, as it points out in this Westward article, which was a cover story, and, and your husband as well as myself were quoted in it, um, it says that on February 17, 2007, that was the night he was killed, um, witnesses say they saw two men running from his house, um, but they left his weed and money behind. Hmm. 
So that's kind of kind of strange. They don't know if it just happened and they just had to get out of there. They were intending to rob them or something else took place. Wow. Wow. But uh, Ken um, was radicalized by reading The Emperor Wears No Clothes by Jack uh, Herrer. Um, I remember late in 92 uh, was about the first time I met Ken, and he came up. Uh, we were uh, promoting marijuana through a, like a normal table or something, and he said, oh, you've got to read this book if you haven't. The, the emperor wears no clothes. And I said, oh, yeah, we, we sure have, and we've been promoting it, and the author, Jack, has been out here. Um, so he was kind of a Johnny-come-lately at that time in yeah. late 92. There were probably about 50 people. I want to say 20, 25 people who were publicly associated, uh, their faces with the marijuana movement in the press, leading rallies, leading groups. But Ken became the public face of the marijuana movement over the next year or two because he took the rallies over at the Capitol, right. the smoke-ins. Uh, they were wildly popular and uh, led to you know the 420 rally that we uh, have today uh, where thousands and thousands thousands of people turn up in Civic Center Park. Um, but yeah, it was incredible when marijuana was still against the law. There would be f anywhere from 150 to maybe uh, 1,500 people at the Capitol listening to bands. I mean, there would be, you know, uh, heavy metal bands <laughs> playing at the Capitol and people smoking weed and he would uh, give out uh, bongs for the best Halloween costume, things like that. And uh, I think he was arrested once or twice for doing that, but uh, not as often as you'd think. Um, Denver really took a hands-off approach. Oftentimes there would be no visible police presence. Were they there? I, I would have to suspect so, but uh, um, they just weren't wearing uniforms. And this went on uh, month after month after month for a year or two until he went to prison for the first time. Wow. Or I don't know if he went a second time, but uh, he did go to prison. So what are these pictures that, that Chris has up? Well, Looks let me like see what you're looking at. Hold there's, on. There's one and there, there was one. Yeah. Okay, that's Ken at the Capitol. I took that one. That's him with a bullhorn and a Colorado State Trooper behind him. I think this might have been a, a rally. I don't, I, think, I don't know if this guy harassed him or arrested him, but uh, that, that's Ken uh, uh, with a bullhorn. One of the early people in Denver promoting marijuana with a bullhorn. And that was Ken and his mother mm -hmm. together at one of the rallies. And Ken's wearing his Freak Brothers T-shirt. Thanks, Chris, for... Uh, going through these. This one I found on the web, um, although it kind of looks familiar, that backyard, but I, I, I really, I, I, I couldn't say. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, uh, but that's Ken, say, Ken, but Ken, Ken with a, a marijuana plant, uh, you know, sometime several years ago. So we need to take a quick break, right? Okay, so, so we're going to, we're going to, Looking and maybe when you come there. back, you could play the, the Carol of the Buds or, or lead out with that. Um, We're brought to you tonight by Noto Urban Garden Supply, located at 1337 uh, 27th, 1330, sorry, 27th Street in Denver, Colorado, between Larimer and Walnut on 27th Street. You know, it's a great time to go visit Noto Urban Garden Supply. If you're thinking about, now that the laws have changed in Colorado, if you're thinking about possibly starting to grow your own marijuana plants, what better place than people who know what they're talking about? Go ahead and check them out. They have a new Facebook page, Noto Urban Garden Supply, and like them on Facebook. Find out what their specials are. Be able to ask some questions. You can also visit them on the web at, web at Nodo, N-O-D-O, UrbanGardenSupply.com. They're open six days a week, closed on Sundays. That's fine because that's when you'd be doing your gardening anyway. So go visit Noto Urban Garden Supply. Tell them you heard about them on iCannabis Radio. We'll be right back. The Law Office of Vets and Maintenance Mats provide criminal defense, medical marijuana defense, and advice about setting up and running medical marijuana centers, optional premises, cultivation operations, and infused product manufacturing businesses throughout Colorado. With offices in Denver and Aspen, we can offer assistance throughout the entire state of Colorado. Give us a call at 303-831-8188. That's 303-831-8188. Or visit us online at warrenetson.com. You're listening to 
with George Edson on iCannabisRadio.com. Carol of the Buds from uh, a, Ken, a Ken Gorman Christmas CD. See, how can you not be in the holiday spirit? And of course, a reluctant messiah like Ken would have a Christmas album. So reluctant. He was a very charismatic, uh, almost cult-like figure. And not necessarily in an evil way, but uh, he was very, at one time, very into metaphysics and... Um, games people play and uh head trips and stuff like that very funny character Um, the first times i met him yeah he um he took my pressure point between my thumb and Mm -hmm. my my forefinger and and promised that he could um relax me completely by by putting pressure right there and and i don't know that i buy it or bought it that day mm-hmm. and really had just met Ken and didn't necessarily, I felt a little bit tactically defensive. But I find myself when I'm feeling anxious, I rub that pressure point because that's what Ken told me to do. Acupressure. It works. Yeah. I, 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 like, I like to think it works. Well, it's, def- it's definitely, I mean, that was years and years and years ago, probably 10 years ago that, that Ken taught me how to do that and I still do it to this day. Of course, there was something else. Ken Gorman recommended for relieving pressure, and that was <laughs> smoke marijuana. Yes. He had a phrase, uh, and maybe if you can find some sometime, Chris, it's his business card. It had his famous phrase on it called, that was, keep on smoking them joints. Mm-hmm. Now, Ken, back before there was uh, internet, really uh, – um, he had a telephone answering machine where he would uh, we're going we're going to get into some uh, nasty language here he, he would have the asshole <gasps> Naughty he language. would have the asshole of the week and he would humorously point out somebody who thought was the asshole of the week and he would provide their phone number yeah. and ask him to I'm, call and i, I think it also that. says governor uh, governor he, of colorado he, 98 he always uh, attempted to try to sort of run for governor and provided him good cover to be there at the Capitol and, uh, <laughs> uh, and um, lead his campaign to legalize marijuana. Um, but Ken was, uh, I think, uh, as his daughter would agree, he was into freedom. And uh, I like her quote from this Westward article, quote, if paper cups were illegal, he would have fought for paper cups <laughs> once, he said. Quote, not a lot of people got that. They got all caught up in marijuana, but that didn't come until later. He was uh, nice. like in Papua New Guinea leading a uh, uprising there or helping with protests. Um, he was an air traffic controller until wow. Reagan cracked down on the air traffic controllers union. They famously were going to go on strike and they pretty much all got uh, canned. Uh, but again, Ken used to have this, um, you'd call it asshole of the week message on his answering machine. And we do have a, a couple of those. Um, hopefully in the next. Um, I can do it when you're ready. Whenever you're ready. Let's see. There's a couple. To ones death or campaign kickoff. To death. Now, these are very low audio, so you might have to tweak it just a little bit. Hey, this is Ken Gorman, next pot smoking governor of Colorado. Thanks for joining me last Saturday in our monthly In Your Face Smoking. I didn't have any weed, so you got me stoned. I thank you very much. I truly enjoy breaking the law on our capital steps, and I will continue this political activity to the death. The drug war sucks, and I'm the fucking enemy. This legislature will face charges of treason, murder, and torture. I've been arrested twice in the last couple of weeks. They stole my weed, my computer, my cash. They even took my scales. These are the items I use in my political campaign, and when they come to arrest me again, I won't have money for bail, but don't worry. I'll run my campaign from a fucking jail cell. Come on out to the Halloween in uh, the last Saturday of this month. Spray bong pipes for the best marijuana costumes. I uh, just hope you're not getting tired of the same old thing, you know, every month. Uh, bands, buds, and bongs, but uh, that's the way I like it. Until then... You know what to do. Just keep on smoking them joints. Keep on smoking them joints. <laughs> Ken. So that was his outgoing message on his on his phone? That's right, yes. That's fantastic. And I used to, um, I thought they were so humorous. And uh, 
Well, I've always been an archivist. I always felt that someday this stuff would be important. And uh, every week um, when he would put a new one up, I'd, you know, put my little uh, tape recorder up against the uh, earpiece of the telephone and record what Ken had to say. <laughs> so I must – I probably have – like an hour and a hour, hour and a half of Ken wow. messages. Did you give the copy of that to his daughter? I no, I have not. We have actually never met. No, not as no. I don't recall ever meeting his daughter at the Capitol or anything like that. Um, I've just read her words in this Westward article. Um, did meet his see his mom that one time, but uh, that was it. But uh, Westward, when they did this piece, they uh, put uh, several of those that I provided to them up on their website, where they still are. Uh, if you want to out there at home, read up on Ken Gorman. Just Google him, Westward plus Ken Gorman, and um, you can read the article that this fella David McSwain wrote. Uh, uh, there's several of the audio clips that I provided them like that. And uh, there's also the uh, Ken Gorman Christmas uh, CD. <laughs> uh, play a bunch so of tracks hilarious. of that. Like uh, one of the songs is Don't Put Eggnog in Your Bong. <laughs> Yeah. Deal. Does anybody <laughs> like eggnog? I do, yeah. You do? Yeah, with some bourbon yeah. in it, yeah. Have you, I, I would need more bourbon. Even without bourbon. I, I like it. Great little nutmeg in it. Very, very tasty. I believe you. Yeah. I believe you. Very holiday spirited. I'm sure Ken Gorman would, if he was here, maybe put a little cannabis tincture and some uh, eggnog. That's right. If he, if he liked eggnog and uh, toast the holiday season that way. That's right. That's mm. right. So what year did was Ken killed he was killed in 2000 uh oh gosh let me see what year was that um 2007 uh february 17th uh, 2007 wow um so yeah it's been five years now since uh he was murdered um he was 60 years old and um I would like to have thought he still had several good years ahead. Absolutely. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, I had no idea that he he had prophesized his death ending in that way. Well, um, yeah. Yeah, he seemed to have. Uh, again, I had one friend tell me that. Uh, and um, in this uh, Westward article, uh, his daughter said something like that, that uh, – um, let's see what she says. Uh, quote, he wasn't worried about getting old because he just said he'd piss off enough people he'd get shot, Valencia said. Quote, he knew that he was on to something big. And, well, that, uh, that, I mean, that's true. That's true. Look, look where we are now. The end right. of, the end of 2012, um, you know, five five years later, mm -hmm. the world has taken a significantly different stance than... We, we've got more of... Uh, hopefully, we have more of a sane drug policy because there were insane activists like Ken who uh, influenced a lot of uh, crazed youths uh, to become involved. And I could just name, like... Scott Green, who sure. used to co-host the radio show with you. Yep. Miguel Lopez, who still holds the 420 rallies. Yep. All these folks were uh, influenced by Ken Gorman or had attended his uh, capital rallies at one time. Well, Ken, Ken ta taught people how to be an activist. I think one of the things that's that – you don't know instinctually no. is is what to do to be an activist. There's people who are loud and obnoxious and think think because they speak out in public that that makes them an activist. And and it, and it's more than that. You have to have a message and you have to be able to relay that message and you have to be consistent with that message. And 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 all of these things, whether you agreed with how Ken mm -hmm. acted or or not, all of these things made his message clear. When you heard the name Ken Gorman, you knew. Don't stop smoking them joints. I mean, you, you you knew that message. Well, yeah, that's true. Um, well, he, he was an activist in the sense that he organized something and, and put a message out there and made the powers that be confront what was taking place, and he had demands. Um, he wasn't the, a great activist in going to lobby the legislature no, no. or uh, trying to appease people or meet them halfway. Right. No, right. you had to shoot way, way above 
what you could even imagine to accomplish, uh, you know, eventually where we are today. Yeah. Well, you know, we can all we can all thank Ken Gorman for 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 where we are today. Thank you, Ken. Thanks, Ken. We're going to take a quick break, our last break of the show. You're listening to iCannabis Radio. I'm on the air with Greg, and we'll be right back. Let's face it, rules and regulations are complicated, especially in the field of medical marijuana. Let Medical Marijuana 101 help you get through the compliance process. We can also explain to you your employment requirements, your employees, and your business. But our work doesn't stop there. Our experience in cultivation ranges from the design of grow rooms to the diagnosis and resolution of grow problems. Visit us at www.medicalmarijuana101.com or call 303-388-7706. That's 303-388-7706. Are you a runner? Are you a runner who supports marijuana legalization? Run on Grass is a group of athletes actively seeking to change our marijuana laws. We speak the truth about cannabis, bringing the message through our feet to new ears. Check out runongrass.com to find out more about us, our events, and how to join up or how to sponsor a runner. If you're in the Denver area, please join us for runs or start a group in your area. Running not your thing? Any sport can do it on Grass. Run on grass.com. I'm Gary Johnson, and you're listening to iCannabis Radio, and I want to say, talk it up, Colorado. Hello. Hi, welcome back. I'm Georgia, and you're listening to iCannabis Radio. It's Monday nights, and Greg is giving us our cannabis history lesson, and we're talking about Ken Gorman. Indeed, Ken Gorman. Um, it was such a galvanizing uh, well, not I don't want to say galvanizing his death, but it mm. um, it touched a, a national nerve. As a matter of fact, when he uh, was murdered, about um, two weeks later, the New York Times uh, wrote a feature article that was headlined: "Killing highlights risks of selling marijuana even legally." March first, Denver, Ken Gorman, an aging missionary of marijuana was found murdered in his home two weeks ago. The unsolved crimes exposing the tangled threads at the borderland of the legal and illegal worlds he inhabited. Mr. Gorman, who was in his 60s, legally provided marijuana to patients under Colorado's medical marijuana law, but he also openly preached the virtues of illegal use and even ran for governor in the 1990s on a pro-drug platform. In recent years, he had grown frightened as the mainstream medicine of cannabis care bumped against the unregulated and violent terrain of the illicit drug market. He had been robbed more than a dozen times in his home on Denver's west side, had recently gotten a gun, and also talked of installing a steel door and gates. So, um, again, his murder um, was recognized by the New York Times. Yeah, I mean, you can't go unnoticed when you're willing to to fly in the face of the law like that. Yeah, he was pretty much, he, like, I think he really loved the uh, reputation of being an outlaw and yeah. that image. And uh, um, smoking that joint, keep on smoking them joints. Well, you know we're we're in a we're in a different phase in Colorado, and the and hopefully our drug policies are starting to make more sense, uh, little by little, and and hopefully it won't take radical movements like those of Ken Gorman to to make the changes that that we still have left to change. Uh, exactly. I think um, what we need to see is, um, and Ken Gorman wouldn't be afraid to uh, bash Obama um, for not uh, for being uh, mealy mouthed and wishy washy in his statements regarding uh, um, Colorado and Washington's law. Um, uh, basically, the president said, "Oh well, we're not going to be out there arresting you know marijuana smokers." Well, you know. No shit, Sherlock. You know, the federal government only has uh, a certain amount of resources, and we know the DEA or whoever isn't going to uh, pop somebody for a joint or for selling an ounce or passing an ounce to a friend, more than likely. But um, the laws are on the books in case they ever want to use it. That's but right. uh, but again, I think, uh, I think Ken Gorman would say that we need to put pressure at this point on um, – 
on the uh, White House and not see them as our allies necessarily and to uh, make demands of them and be willing to stand up for those demands. I agree. I agree. Did you want Chris to play anything else? Well, yeah, Chris, uh, there is that other uh, phone message from Ken Gorman. Let's hear Ken in his own voice again. Hello, this is Ken Gorman with Blue Feather Options. We're still the largest marijuana dealer here in the state. Well, my time as a political prisoner in the Denver City Jail for my horrendous crime of smoking a joint at the marijuana rally has given me a few things to think about. There's quite a few of us that have offered a way for our state to eliminate pollution, pay for medical care for everyone, make our education system the best, and most of all, we've offered the solution to the gang wars and the violence that grips our state. We've even offered a way to pay for these solutions and at the same time eliminate the personal state income tax. Every time we offer our solutions to the politicians, we're told to get fucked and harassed by the cops and the narcs. Well, now we're offering our solutions to the people of Colorado. I am hereby announcing my candidacy for the office of governor. There will be a smoke in and a campaign kickoff at the state capitol on January 1st, 1994. High noon, of course. I don't care how hungry you are. <laughs> be there. You might even get to see the future governor's asshole off to jail again. <laughs> There's also some jerk-offs out there that have threatened to shoot me at our rally, so it should be exciting. The asshole of the week is Queen Elizabeth. She knighted George Bush, the biggest cocaine dealer in America. Sir Bush, uh, think about that one. You don't need to call her. I'm sure the English have their heads hung low all over the world. Now stop by our outlet at uh, 302 South Broadway. We still have the best marijuana in town. And we'll be adding our political info soon. Or you can leave your name and number at the beep. We have lots to talk about. Now, okay, that's the best. So your outgoing message is three minutes long, and you expect these people to listen long enough to leave a well, message. Uh, who, where would people get the idea to call Ken Gorman and, <laughs> and you know, and even think about talking to him or buying marijuana f from him? Um, well, uh, his ad on the back of Westward. He, he advertised on the back of Westward. Uh, uh, marijuana, I, f I forget what it said. That's great. It had some cagey thing, like maybe it was hemp, like maybe it was just doing hemp business, but uh, uh, if you wanted to buy marijuana, I'm sure it was probably quite possible. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Anything else on Ken? I think, um, you know, um, that, that clip uh that audio clip just again highlights his uh personality his smooth yes. talking voice yes. you could see where he might have been made a great uh, i cannabis radio host with that he voice um you can see where he might have been a one-time air traffic controller having to use a voice like that sure. um so uh again he was a very charismatic uh funny person um doesn't mean he didn't piss off people occasionally. Most people got pissed off at him, but it was hard to stay pissed off at him. And uh, really uh, sad, uh, sad that he's gone and not here to uh, enjoy this Christmas with uh, legal marijuana in Colorado. That's right. But That's he right. would say, keep on smoking them joints. <laughs> Well, Greg, as always, thank you so much you for bet. our cannabis history lesson. That was wonderful. Um, we have a, f a few minutes left. And before I get into kind of what's going on around town and what's going on around iCannabis Radio, I want to get back a little bit into our discussion. We, t we started the evening talking a little bit about um, the tragedy in Newtown, Connecticut. And um, I think as, as a radio station, I really feel... Uh, compelled to say that we are not interested in jumping on the media bandwagon and sensationalizing this event. That's not what, what we're about. We're not going to talk about um, the murderer. We're going to talk about uh, what what to do to heal and the victims and, and sort of what it feels like. Um, because because I think one of the things that that happens is is when mentally ill people get to that place and they want to go out with a bang, they they get their motivation and ideas and feel like they can live in infamy if they go out in some kind of sensational, 
horrible fashion like this. And and we don't want to be part of allowing that to continue. What we want to talk about and what we want to focus on is is the fact that we can utilize these these tragic occurrences to remind ourselves that that really we are one small world united in 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 a couple of things and those things are um, you know the greatest gift that we could possibly have is the health and strength of our children um, you know as trite as it sounds our children are indeed our future and we are setting the stage for for their world and their lives and and by doing things like promoting responsible drug policy and changing bad laws we are setting up a much better world for our children, and that's really important to us here at iCannabis Radio, as well as I know it's important to those of you who are who are listening, and and everything that we can do to make our world a little bit better and a little bit safer um, helps us all get through this grieving process. helps Helps us all recognize that that while horrible things happen. Um, we can work every day to 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 counterbalance that by making good things happen for our kids. Um, I know I've spent a lot of time over the past couple of days um, stealing kisses from my eight year old and 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 holding him tight and and I've I was sort of mad at myself that um, that I while I while I shower my kid with kisses um, I I realize that. I could do it 20 times more and I, and I will. And, and I'm an extremely affectionate parent. And I think that um, my kid at the point in time that he says, mom, leave me alone. That's when I, that's when I will uh, realize I will have done it enough. Um, so, so please, please focus on, on what you do to make, to make this world a better place and not focus on the acts of one very sick, terrible individual. Um, as we as we close tonight, I want to tell you about some some things going on locally in Denver. The Industry White Ball Award Ceremony and Cash Hide Foundation fundraiser is this Wednesday, the nineteenth, at Castleman's, starting at six p.m. Castleman's is located at twenty six twenty Walnut Street. Um, Cash Hide, as you know, was the the little boy who was a medical marijuana patient in Montana who died in November um, from his cancerous brain tumor. And the Cash Hide Foundation is a foundation raising money to provide what they call reggae runners to to kids in children's hospitals. Uh, reggae runners are uh, wagons that allow kids to put all of their their IVs and tubes and so forth uh, mm-hmm. on this wagon so that they can move about and they're not stuck in their hospital room. Mm-hmm. And and so please, if you're in town, please come out uh, to the Industry White Ball and give some money, money that will go to the Cash Hide Foundation. You can also visit cashhidefoundation.org uh, and donate online as well. Because it is the holiday season over the next couple of weeks, iCannabis Radio will be a little bit spotty. You can always listen to our recorded shows online um, if we are not live. I uh, The Monday show on the 24th and the 31st will be, um, will be dark. We will be spending time with our families. I know that I am going to have a... Um, eight-year-old slumber party at my house on New Year's Eve. If you are having more fun on New Year's Eve, I'd like to know it because I think that's impossible. But please, if you are home and you would like to listen, we have great recorded shows that um, you can give a second listen to. Remember that we have a great week's worth of shows tomorrow night, Sex Pot Radio from 8 to 10. And it is, yes, tomorrow is the 18th of December and that is Chris Rosales's birthday. birthday Chris and look out is all I can say look out thank you thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> and Thursday from 4 to 5 um, the Hemp Connoisseur magazine and then Overgrow the Radio from 7 to 9 and um, really quick the Amendment 64 um, task force had their first meeting today. We will keep you abreast of, of what recommendations come out of that task force as well. And watch our Facebook posts as we will be keeping you up to date on the news, even if our shows are dark during the holiday season. So whatever you celebrate um, 
or don't celebrate, please know that we are happy that you join us here on iCannabis Radio, and we were, are grateful for your listenership. And for our sponsors, Mile High Wellness, Noto Urban Garden Supply, Edson Maintenance Mats, Medical Marijuana, The Rockies, Cuffle Collimore and Company, Medical Marijuana 101, and Run on Grass. My name is Georgia. You've been listening to iCannabis Radio. I'm with Chris and Greg. With all, I'd like to say good night and thanks for listening. Happy holidays. Hey, ho, ho, ho. <laughs>